Well, this isn't entirely shocking to have come out, as there was already an investigation into the ethics of some of the situation involving this paper. This paper, though, is just the scientific reasons for that investigation, and there's a good amount to get into, and let's just start with some introduction. In December of 2021, a paper came out by De Palma et al., which was investigating what time of year the impact that actually killed off the non-avian dinosaurs would have happened. This was then followed up pretty quickly by another paper by During et al., which investigated at what time of year the impact that would have killed off the non-avian dinosaurs would have happened. So, pretty similar subject matters. However, both sites are actually dealing with the exact same material coming from the Tannis site in the Hell Creek Formation. This site has been getting a lot of publicity for a lot of reasons, and a lot of it is unpublished, so hopefully we'll get some more research done on it so we can actually understand it better. But for this paper, they were looking at what was happening in the fish in this deposit. And that's because there's little spherules of glass from essentially an impact that are inside the gills of these fish. These would have been filter feeding fish like sturgeon and like paddlefish. And so it's really good evidence that, yeah, these fish were swimming around when the impact happened and died because of it. So literally, they died on the day, or very close to, the day the impact happened. As for the malpractice, that was alleged against the De Palma et al. paper, largely because there's some inconsistencies in the methods that they were using and the results they ended up getting. And that's basically what this paper is looking at in a scientific manner. It is laying out what those inconsistencies are and what they might mean for the De Palma et al. paper. The main issue this all comes back to is what's called scooping, when essentially someone is ready to publish a paper and another researcher comes in, takes that data, and publishes it themselves first. And that's what it's alleged that the De Palma team actually might have done. And again, the methodological considerations do come into this, but also just some of it potentially being made up, which I will discuss here in a moment. This is also particularly prevalent for early career researchers like Dr. During, who only received her PhD a few weeks ago, so very much an early career paleontologist in the field. I will also suggest this is one paper where it might be useful to go through the different versions that were submitted, because during each submission it has to go through a round of peer review, then it can get resubmitted with some changes, and then another round of peer review, and then finally it gets accepted to the journal, and it can get published, and that's what happened here. All those reviews, though, are public, so you can go to the website and find those reviews and look through them yourselves. That said, it is really interesting to see how this paper took apart the De Palma et al. paper. One of the first things the During et al. team did is looked at the isotope data from the De Palma paper, and what they found is inconsistencies. And these isotopes were largely taken from spines of these fish that were fossilized in the Tana site. These fish have variable growth, especially on their spines, throughout the year. But that also means you can measure those isotopes, and depending on the time of year, you're going to get different concentrations of certain isotopes. This is largely due to things like oxygen having multiple isotopes, and heavier ones being less likely to evaporate, especially in warm temperatures. So those summer temperatures actually cause an enrichment in the heavier oxygen isotope. There's also inconsistencies on which specimens were actually used for this analysis because one of the key parts of science is being able to reproduce results. And if you don't know what specimen was actually used for the analysis, nobody else can go in there, take their own data, and get their own samples, and then test that again. So it's just this big gap in what we're expecting. It's a fundamental problem with this study where we don't know how to actually reproduce the results. Additionally, that goes in with, hey, they didn't name what facility did the analysis. This is especially true as it seems like the graphs that they put into the paper for the isotope data aren't actually from the original source, instead it was made secondarily, which does have some issues as you would expect it to have the original data from the facility which did this analysis. Unfortunately, one of the researchers on the De Palma et al. paper had passed away before its publication, and they were the one who allegedly sent these samples off for analysis. But none of the facilities that really run that kind of analysis can remember that, and also you would still expect to have that original data in the notes of that researcher somewhere. And you would also especially expect it to be sent to the lead author on the paper, so that they're not having to kind of make it up based on what they've heard the data is like. As for the graphs themselves, there are some really weird things, because paddlefish and sturgeon are used, and sturgeon actually move to salt water pretty regularly, so you'd expect some differences in the isotopic signature. And you do get that in the changes in delta oxygen, however, when you're looking at delta carbon, so the carbon changes in carbon isotopes that are present, you don't see the same changes. They're basically identical. So unless the sturgeon were going offshore and feeding in the exactly the identical way as the paddlefish at basically all times of the year, 
there's something weird going on. And it seems like potentially even just one of the crafts got accidentally duplicated. There's very simple explanations for a lot of this, but again, it's still just a little funny. Additionally, with those samples, there's nothing written about how large those samples were, how they were treated before they were tested, or how precise the data that were received from the isotope analyses actually were. There are methods that do leave something to be desired still though, and that's because the researchers also talked about taking 43 separate samples from 0.8 millimeters of the fish spine that was used in the study, which means the drill bit would be incredibly small, less than half the width of the human hair, which those do exist, but they're not commonly used because that doesn't really produce enough material to get precise numbers. So it doesn't really seem like it was that likely that this is what they used. It just seems off. As for the communication of those results, there's 43 samples from the specimen. However, when you look at the graph, there's 35 data points on the graph. And there are some changes on the graph that don't have data points listed there, but that just kind of shows maybe it wasn't necessarily built correctly because they just forgot to add the data point that should be right there. It, again, it's just speaking to kind of the weird validity of this paper, or potentially even non-validity of this paper, as we continue to go through more of the issues with it. As for the graphs, it's basically looking at from the start of the section that was sampled all the way to the end of it, so that 0.8 millimeters. And then it's showing, hey, this is what this sample read at this point along that 0.8 millimeters. What's interesting is they got two samples from multiple places. We're essentially, hey, we're this far along the section and we drilled twice and put in two samples and didn't mention that anywhere else in the methods. It really does make it seem like it's just a mistake in how these graphs were put together because these were put together by hand not by using the original data from the facility which ran the analysis. And as for the error bars that are added, there's some of these data points that are just missing error bars entirely. Some of these are also just misaligned from where it says the sample is in the bone versus where it shows up on the graph. So it's just a fundamental issue with what they were actually saying they were doing and how they made the graphs. It's really kind of surprising that this got through peer review when there's that many issues with the actual graphs, which are one of the main hinge points for the entire paper's arguments. While there wasn't a facility mentioned, there was a specific machine mentioned for taking these isotopic samples though, and that is a gas bench 2 linked to a Thermo Finnegan dual inlet MAT253 stable isotope ratio mass spectrometer, which is just a fancy machine that can measure isotopes. And the thing is, the Durham team used exactly the same kind of machine, and in their experience, the sizes of samples that the Paula team would have been getting with those kind of really, really thin and fragile drill bits would not be enough to get this kind of high fidelity on the isotopes. All of this is just to say that isotopic data from the fish samples in the De Palma study, it smells a little fishy, pun intended. It just doesn't seem to line up with what you would expect, and the methods don't really provide a lot of evidence that what the results are are actually correct to what they should be. As for other odd similarities in some of the data, all of the fish sampled added exactly 800 microns of bone growth to these spines, which is really interesting because, yeah, sure, that growth would be limited during the growing season, but that also means that they weren't just hanging out in the same ecosystem. There's not some that were at 800, there's not some that were at 802, they were all at exactly 800. So instead of just being in the same ecosystem, they are feeding and living in exactly the same conditions 100% of the growing season. It is wildly bizarre to find that kind of data. It's a big red flag for any kind of statistician. This is also strange when you look at some of these graphs, which don't seem that similar until you start stretching or shrinking them a little bit. You wouldn't expect there to be different growing seasons in different sizes of animals. They'd still be growing during the same time. However, again, when you pull out the graphs, they look pretty similar. It's almost kind of like the meme. Hey, can I copy your homework? Sure, but don't make it obvious you copied it. So they moved around a couple of data points just a little bit and then shrink it so it's not as obvious. It seems very suspect, and I'm not saying for sure that's what happened, but it needs some real explanation. And the original data from the facility that measured all of these animals would certainly be able to help provide that. But again, there is no such facility listed. The entire thing is very suspect. And then there's the issues with the supplemental photos. These are a little more buried in the paper. However, when you're looking at it, figures three and figure five are actually the same specimen, despite the article describing them as separate specimens. These are thin sections of the bone, or potentially just thin sections since it seems like they're the same specimen. What you do is you take that specimen, you mount it onto a piece of glass using special epoxy that doesn't change the way the light refracts, and then you are able to grind that down very thin to as little as 30 microns so that light can pass through it. 
then you shoot light through it and you can count all the different features that are in it and see a lot of those microstructures by using a microscope. Now there's a lot to discuss with these images and why they're the same specimen. And it's gonna sound a little bit random as I'm talking about all these different things. It's gonna be kind of like Charlie Day talking about Pepe Silvia in the mailroom where he's just, you know, that whole meme. It's great, but I just, trust me, just follow through with me, it will make sense. When thin sections are mounted with the epoxy, oftentimes there are air bubbles, but that also means you just flip the slide over and look at it from the other side, because that way you can still see all of those same features and the air bubble isn't there. However, in Supplemental 5, you can start seeing one of these air bubbles that is very clearly present in the specimen. Figure 3 though, which again is said to be an entirely different specimen, also has a little bit of an air bubble there. And when you zoom in on it and flip and rotate it, you can see they actually line up pretty well. This is also really important because one of these photos was taken on the microscope based on what it looks like, whereas the other one was taken through a camera through the lens of the microscope. And that sounds like a really minor difference, but when you're showing a camera through the lenses of a microscope, you get some distortion. And that's been really well documented and it's very easy to correct for. And once you correct for that in figure three, turns out it actually lines up perfectly with figure five. It is the same specimen. They line up exactly the same. And I wanna be clear here. The air bubble is not that big of a deal. It's kind of inconvenient and it's something you would definitely roll your eyes at and say, hey, go get a better photo of this by just flipping it around. But it's not something that's gonna devastatingly impact the conclusions of the paper. However, when you're using the same specimen twice and calling it different things, that is an issue. And potentially it is just something where the files got moved around and shuffled and labeled wrong. That is very possible. However, also you would expect a paper to be able to correct itself if it was doing that, especially when there's something really distinct like this air bubble to be able to track that with. There's also issues with the information being presented about just fish sizes in the De Palma paper. They state that the smallest of the different fish, the sturgeon and paddlefish in this formation, are about 16 centimeters. However, when you actually look at the rest of their paper, and especially some of the crabs, you see that there's fish that are not in that size range and are actually smaller than that present in their sample. So which one is it? You would expect some level of internal consistency within its own paper. All of these various issues combined really throw into doubt the De Palma et al. conclusions, which their conclusions were the impact happened somewhere between late spring and early summer. Meanwhile, the During et al. paper from just a little bit afterwards, concluded that it was definitely an early spring and used those more precise methods and listed all of their methods. So it's much safer to say that the During et al. paper is more accurate. I actually wanna quote one of the reviewers here, Thomas Cullen, who's done a ton of work looking at isotopes in the fossil record, and so is very familiar with all of these techniques. Overall, I think that the authors here make a compelling case that the results of De Palma et al. study are very irregular and largely irreproducible or verifiable at present. Their concerns are clear and concise. Indeed, it certainly raises questions concerning the editorial and peer review process, not to mention formal rebuttal article process of the journal which originally published the De Palma et al. study, given that the study lacks any reporting of its primary analytical data, has an unusually brief and vague methods section, lacks any data availability statement, and of course, also produced fairly unusual and in places implausible results plots, from which one would normally turn to the raw data to verify, but which one can of course not do in this case. So yeah, there's fundamental problems with that De Palma et al. study. And even using very similar methods, Melanie During came to similar conclusions, however, more precise conclusions by including all of those different parts of the methods in her paper. It's something that just makes sense. You need to be able to reproduce science. And part of that is telling people how you actually did the science. And to be fair to the journal that did publish the De Palma paper, there is a disclaimer saying, hey, this is under investigation for academic integrity. However, that disclaimer has been up there for two years, so it's up to just fate kind of to see whether or not it's gonna get changed. Because maybe it will and maybe it won't. This paper though, this current 2024 paper by During It All, I think really highlights the major issues in the De Palma study.